Tiny House Fest Vermont. First year. Woo! <laughs> I, I'm Erin Miley O'Keefe, and this is Lisa Kuhneman, and we also have another cohort, Betsy Hall, who's around. And uh, I guess it was maybe five months ago, we said, we were, I was holding little tiny house talks in my house, and Betsy said, we should do a festival. And I was like, I don't know, I'm building a tiny house this year. That's like, seems kind of crazy. And then she said it again. And then the third time she said it, I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and here we are. So thanks for turning out. Um, Festival. That's it. That's what we want to hear. Raise the house. Let's hear some noise. <laughs> we have Lena here. There's Blair. Woo! <laughs> and who are you? My name is Dominic Mangano. I own Jamaica Cottage Shop. Many of you have asked me the question today, how did you get started building tiny houses? Building dog houses, of course. <laughs> that is a true story. I started dragging uh, scrap home from work and I built dog houses. People started asking me for sheds. I started building sheds. He said, wow, great shed. I could live in that. That's sorry. Blair? My name is Blair. I am with the Yellow School Bus. His name is Wayne. Um, everyone asks, how did you get into the school bus? Uh, we like wanted to, we just wanted to live tiny like the rest of you guys and um, found him in a junkyard and decided that we had to make it work. Um, yeah, so here we are. <laughs> Hi, my name is Linda Menard. I live in Portland, Oregon, where I have a company called Niche Consulting. I do sustainable design consulting work. I've come out to the fine state of Vermont many times uh, because I teach with Yes Tomorrow Design Build School a couple times a year. Um, so I'm really glad to be here. Um, and I'm trying to think what it is everybody asks me other than what do you do about your toilet, um, which you probably noticed tiny house people tend to talk about. Do you time it? Sometimes we time it and we're like, oh, look, we went eight minutes without talking about poop. Um, but this session is not about that. This session is about taking the plunge, how you decide it's time to go tiny, um, how you actually make the shift to going tiny, and uh, what the reasons are that somebody might want to go tiny, and what the reasons are that somebody might not want to go tiny. You can ask us those questions too. So we're gonna run this mostly as Q&A and we'll sprinkle in stories throughout because that's more fun. Anything we wanna add to that? Question and answer. I would love to hear everybody in the audience raise their hand and give me what they want to talk about. And I agree with Lena. It is amazing when we don't talk about poop because it always seems to go that direction. Always. We can definitely talk about that later. However, making the plunge, taking that plunge, it is a lifestyle change. You're going to go ahead and narrow everything down, all of your earthly possessions. You're going to bring them to a, a position where you feel comfortable waking up in the morning and making that decision on what you're going to wear. You won't have many choices. <laughs> go ahead. If you have a question, I'd love to hear them. Water. Water. The question is water. What are you going to do about it? We all need it. It's H2O. And you're going to need to get it to your house at some point because that's what humans need to live. So what are you going to do about that water? You only have a few choices. 
One, you're gonna tie it into the municipality, the one that goes ahead and feeds you fresh water. You're gonna tie it into that system. Or you're gonna tie it into a well, a well there that's driven on the property, and you're gonna have it pressurized most likely from the main house. If it's not pressurized from the main house, you're gonna pressurize it with a pressure tank inside your tiny. Lastly, you're going to carry that water into the house. Remember the little yokes you carry water in? Of course, if you want to talk about tanks, you want to put inside your tiny, then that is a great choice. About six hours. It's different over here, I understand. So um, the pressurized systems, having, having water inside your house and then planning space for the water tank inside your house is a lot more important here. But there certainly are people who carry water. And when I lived in a yurt, um, I carried in water. And it's amazing how little water one uses when one carries it. So if you're really intending to be mindful about your resource consumption, carrying your water is a great way to do that. Um, I lived uh, for a couple of years, actually, um, not having a shower in my tiny houses either. I've lived in a yurt a travel trailer two tiny houses, now three tiny houses on wheels. Um, and uh, in a couple of those places, I didn't have a shower. So showered at the gym, showered at, you know, at school, at work, et cetera. And that actually works. It's, it's pretty doable. Oh, I'll, tag. I'll jump in on this. Um, in the bus, we don't currently have flowing water. We're the type of, but we're the type of tiny house that bring, brings water in. We carry it in. And um, I'll tell you that it is a pain and you are very conscious of like, okay, we brought in seven gallons today and we're going to bring in seven gallons tomorrow. And it's, uh, it's been a hot summer and, um, you, you're aware that like, yes, I'm drinking. I know I need to drink somewhere, um, between like what, 56 ounces of water a day to or maintain a healthy, a healthy diet. But some days you drink less water and some days you, you brush your teeth with no water and, and you, you make that sacrifice. You don't, you don't wash your hands with water, you wash your hands with like hand sanitizer. Um, but you make it work and you use creative spaces, like you do shower at the gym or you shower at your best friend's house from time to time. Um, um, you just like, you, you find really creative ways to make it work. You start showing up with laundry again, like you did when you were you know, in college. Um, and how many of you have ever carried your own water? Yeah, and do you appreciate the heck out of running water? Yeah. Super, super huge gratitude. You know, people all over the world don't have the luxury of even asking, so are you going to do a pressurized tank? Are you going to, you know, for a lot of people, carrying water is the only option. So we're really lucky to have so many options. Um, just be thoughtful about what really works for your lifestyle. The question is, can we take the sheds and easily turn them into living spaces? Yes, absolutely. That is what we specialize in. Specifically at Jamaica Cottage Shop, we build cold storage buildings. They may look cute and fancy and little cabin and tiny house-like, but essentially what we do is what we start with is a cold storage building. Turning that into a comfortable living space will come back to your budget. What is your budget and what is your comfort level? So if your comfort level exists with no insects and no rodents running over your bed, then what we're going to do is bring that to a very high degree of comfort, and that's going to jump that budget up. But any of the buildings, any of the designs can be turned into a four-season, year-round use living building, including running water. The question is, um, how long does it take you to, did it take us to pare down all of our possessions, and how, much, how many possessions do we currently have, roughly? Okay, so um, our dwelling is 100 square feet. We, we transitioned from a 2,600 square foot loft. We had a lot of possessions. Um, I like to play this game, and when I get this question from friends, um, it's a kind of cruel mind game, but you take a 56 um, quart container, plastic container, put it in the middle of the room, put it in the middle of your house, set a timer for 20 minutes, now your house is on fire, and you have 20 minutes to get all of your possessions that you absolutely want into the box. 
So you, you do it and you figure out, okay, these are obviously the most important things. And then you take your clothes and you do the exact same game. Then you take half of those clothes and that's how many you actually get to take with you. Um, you don't need 10 of the exact same styled thing in different colors. You don't need 20 pairs of shoes. You need a good pair of shoes for walking, a good pair of shoes to go like sandals, and a nice pair of shoes to go out. And that's like really what you need. It's the same with kitchen gadgets. We all have a million kitchen gadgets. You don't need that many things. Yeah. How, long, how long did it take you? Oh. I am guessing more than 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, our process took... Uh, we did an initial downsize, um, which took about a week, and then we did a, a second downsize, which took about a week, and the whole process, I think, took us three weeks to downsize everything in our life, um, but it was a process of, like, like, okay, I've downsized section A, now I'm going to take half of section A, and that's going to become section B, and I'm going to take half of section B, and that's going to become C, and then half of that, and that's what we moved into our house. So my downsizing also happened in phases. I started when I was living in about 800 square feet. Um, my roommate moved out, so that went half the stuff. Um, and then as I was downsizing, there were a couple books I used that I found to be really incredible resources. One of them is Unstuff Your Life by Andrew Mellon, and he kind of takes you through room by room. Um, the other one, which I didn't discover until later because it didn't exist at the time, um, was the books by Marie Kondo, uh, The KonMari Method. So she has the life-changing magic of tidying up and spark joy. Um, and those are two books I use in the downsizing e-course that I teach, um, which I'll tell you more about in a second. But um, in my initial downsizing, which I think took about a month, um, I cleared out, you know, stuff from my house, and, and it's interesting because it was the first house I'd ever owned. It was this 800 square foot two bedroom cottage, um, and so clearing out a lot of space there. One of the most interesting things to me was realizing that I was even more comfortable, even in the bigger space with less stuff. And then when I moved into a travel trailer. Um, which was my next move, I had a lot of, you know, I didn't have much stuff with me, so I actually had a few things in storage still, because I knew I'd be upsizing to a tiny house. Um, so at that point, it was really about, can I fit it in the tiny house? That was kind of the design consideration, like, can I fit this in the tiny house? And then as my process continued, especially when I lived in the yurt, I did... Um, I did what I called my things challenge. There's a book called uh, The Hundred Things Challenge. It's by a guy named Dave Bruno. And uh, he, talks, he talks about living for a year with just 100 personal possessions. And um, I, I personally think that he's got kind of a funny way of counting. Because he, he counted library, for instance, as one thing. Um, <laughs> but he also counted just one pen. So, you know, one of the things that really struck me about that is that you get to make up your own rules for your counting method. So I had a blog post about, you know, who's counting anyway, and so I, I detailed my list. So I moved into the yurt with 198 things, and I moved out of the yurt with 196 things, or maybe it was 90, 192 things. So I actually had a little less afterwards. Um, I'm not counting, you know, religiously anymore, but it is really interesting to, to pay attention that way because what I found is that when I was paying attention to the count more than the volume, it wasn't so much, will this thing fit in my house, but does this thing fit in my life? Is this one of the things that's worth counting? So that was one of my, one of my exercises in the big second round. Um, so that was fun. Dominic, what about you? What's, what's, tell us about your stuff. <laughs> well, when I graduated Green Mountain College in 91, my parents expected me to put on a tie, fill out a resume, and get myself a job. I had different ideas. I bought myself a Subaru, I took my two dogs, and I left the house. I went on a cross-country excursion living out of that car for four years. I lived all over the country, looking and living and expanding and learning all of the different types of ways to build across the nation. Some places like Anchorage, was concerned about earthquakes. Some places like Phoenix were concerned about fire, wildfires. So when I took all that, I came back to Vermont. After seeing 48 of the 50 states, I, I was very adamant about coming to Vermont. And I thought Vermont was one of the prettiest states in the nation. When I got back here, I pride myself. It took me 15 minutes, three trips to the car, and one of those trips was for dog food. <laughs> yes. What do you do with all the stuff you get rid of? 
the question is, what do you do with all the stuff that you get rid of? Um, we sold all of our stuff um, to friends. What came out of that was $5,000 income that we didn't expect that we ended up fueling part of our trip across the country. Um, we were able to do a lot more things that we we hadn't planned or had expected to do. Um, but what's nice is, is what you don't sell we gave away to friends, and when we went back to um, where we just left in Colorado, it was nice to see your possessions live on with somebody else, and like see somebody else's house decorated in your old things. It's like, I gave you that, and, it, and it's living a new life in your house. Um, so yeah, we sold it, and what we didn't sell, we gave away, and what we, what nobody else would take, we donated to Salvation Army and, and a local charity. Yeah, I want to echo that that's a really good question. Um, it's one of the things that comes up. I, so I teach an e-course that's seven weeks long. Um, tonight's the registration deadline. If anybody wants to join, join up tonight. Um, if you sign up with an accountability buddy, you get rebates every time you do your homework. So it's really fun. Um, but one of the things we talk about is where does it go, right? Because a lot of the books that talk about downsizing, especially you know the KonMari method, it talks about just like, oh, get out garbage bags and throw it all away. It's so refreshing, you know, you don't have to think about it anymore. And for a lot of us, that's not a sensibility that works with us, right? We, you know, if we live in in New England or if we live in the Pacific Northwest, we don't throw things away. We recycle and we compost and you know all these other things. So, so figuring out the most responsible way to purchase prevents us from having to figure out the most responsible way to purge. So that reduce, reuse, recycle system really starts with the reduce part, and then the reuse part. Use it as long as you can. And then the recycle part, which may be, you know, as Blair said, passing it on to a friend, donating it. And I think the, the interesting part is really paying attention to where things responsibly go. So for instance, I discovered in our, in our community we're able to donate old towels to the Humane Society. They love them, you know? So the old towels that are you know, not nice enough to give away, um, not nice enough to donate, the animal shelter can use, you know? And sometimes, um, sometimes the, the uh, shelters, the people shelters, um, will take shampoo bottles that are opened, you know, those sorts of things. So there are places usually where you can get rid of things um, that are responsible, that are thoughtful. Um, one of my other favorites is what I call goodbye stories, which is, a lot of times, the things that we have, we have because they have some sentimental value to us, right? There's a reason we've hung on to them all this time. And so sometimes, I heard somebody say that's my problem. Yeah, OK. Um, sometimes it's important for us to have a release story for that object, too. So for instance, I had a, a coat that my grandmother gave to me. I'm the smallest of all my sisters, so I'm the only one it would fit because my grandma was you know, as big as I was and shrinking. Um, so she gave me this fur coat. And uh, I'm not really a fur coat person, but it was from my grandma. And it was nice, and it was expensive. It was just not my thing. And I moved it, and I moved it, and I moved it, and I didn't wear it, and I moved it, and I didn't wear it. And finally, you know, and people kept saying, why don't you sell it? And I'm like, I don't really, that doesn't feel right to me. So finally what I did was I ended up finding out that the Humane Society will accept fur coats for their wildlife animal rescue programs. And that seemed kind of like a nice way to give it back to where it was supposed to be in the first place. <laughs> you know, so I now have a story for how I got rid of it, as well as a story for how I got it. And that object then has served its purpose in my life. You know, I don't need to hang on to it anymore because it came and it went. So goodbye stories have become an important way for me to get rid of those things that would otherwise be hard to get rid of but really don't suit my lifestyle anymore. Should we add a collective tag sale next year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The question is uh, sustainability of your tiny house. So what do you do with it when you don't need it anymore? Did I get that? Well, yeah, and, and how, how can, is it possible to grow with a tiny house, have a family in a tiny house? Is it possible to raise a family in a tiny house? Uh, are you expecting? No. <laughs> and so what it is when I am working with individuals, I often ask, 
What is it that you want this building to do now and in the future? We are all going to leave this earth at some point. This house that I build you will most likely still be here with us. What is it that you expect this house to do when you no longer need it? Will you pass it on to your family? Will you plan on selling it? Or do you plan on deconstructing it and using the materials for something else? So that is something that I review with each individual to say, what is it that you want this building for now and in the future? Another question I always ask, how often do you plan on moving your tiny house? And that goes ahead and helps me in the design process and being able to create the space for you that will work for now and in the future. So make it sustainable, and whether or not it is going to grow with your lifestyle, that is a question that most likely only you can answer. And being able to do that and be able to create a family inside that small space may go ahead and exist in creating a larger space and having the children have their own space to be able to grow and, and nurture as they need. So to be able to answer your question, I think uh, it would be different for each individual. I want to piggyback on this because a lot of people think that you can't have a growing family in such a small space. And I have a very dear friend um, who lives in Florida with her husband, three dogs, and five kids. They live in a schoolie that is uh, 40 foot long, so it's it's a big, tiny house. Um, if you don't know what a schoolie is, it's, it's a school bus that has been converted into a living situation. And um, they've been doing it for the last 10 years. And, and they love it. Three dogs and five kids, and she has a husband. And um, it's it. they started with just her and her husband, and then she got pregnant, and they had a bassinet in the corner, and then they did a revamp of the inside. They put in their first set of bunk beds, and then they had twins, and so then they had three, and so then they had two bunk beds and a bassinet, and, or, and, and it just kept growing, and it just kept growing. And that's one of the nice things about building your own space is that you have that ability to grow your house, and you know where, like, every nook and cranny is, and you know, you know, I know what screws I put in to build my bed, and I can take those same screws out and upgrade it. Do you want to add the part about your family? Huh? Do you want to add the family that you guys would have um, yeah, so I mean, you're, we're a young couple, and um, eventually we're, oh, we're both young people. My fiance and I are a very young couple, and eventually we do want to have kids, um, and we've, we've learned to that, and so we already have plans on moving our bed from where it currently is up into that loft stargazing space, and eventually, like, putting in a little kid's bunk room, um, and that's what's nice about it, is that you're, you, you know, and you can grow, and you can plan for that. So there actually are quite a few families now who are exploring living small in tiny houses on wheels. Um, but again, this is, I think, one of those reminder points in terms of people live with families in small spaces all around the world, right? Whenever somebody says, oh, tiny houses are such a fad, I usually say, no, actually, I think the McMansion's the fad because I'm pretty sure we've been living in tiny houses ever since humans became humans, right? This is this is what we do. We live in this in space that shelters us, right? So um, there's a book I'm going to just, you know, I can't be unbiased about this, but there's a great book that just came out um, called Turning Tiny. I've got a chapter in there talking about the tiny house community I live in. There are quite a few stories in there about families living in tiny homes and how they did it. Um, you might check out Macy Miller's story. She has two kids and a Great Dane in a tiny house, and she did a remodel and closed her porch to create a bedroom for her kids. So the tiny homes do have the potential to be modified. One thing you might notice looking around, uh, you know, Broadway is that there are actually a lot of homes that started out tiny, and that there were additions that were added as new members joined the family. You know, maybe a parent moved in, or maybe a kid was born, and that sort of thing. So, um, so there, there's certainly ways to modify houses, both ground-bound and on wheels. But I think the other thing to keep in mind is that tiny homes aren't necessarily forever homes. Just like studio apartments aren't necessarily forever homes, and four-bedroom, three-bath houses aren't necessarily forever homes, our housing often changes with our life cycle. You know, and and in America, where people move on average every seven years, 
it's not that big a deal to move housing when you need to move housing. You know, the nice thing about a tiny house is that you can move on without moving out, but that doesn't mean that you don't still have housing flexibility. You can find ways to do that. We're at time. <laughs> That's it. Come ask us questions later. <laughs>